Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to the second session of this academic year's uh, Neonatal Human Dynamics and Targeted Neonatal Echo Foundations curriculum. My name is Danny Weiss. I'm a neonatologist at Sunnybrook. I'm one of the education co-chairs, along with Dr. Danielle Rios, uh, for the Foundations Curriculum and the Education Committee at the Neonatal Human Dynamics Research Center. Uh, thank you for joining. I think I'm going to give a couple minutes just for uh, the audience to trickle in, and then we'll get started. Okay, I see the audience entering has slowed down to a trickle. So we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Very excited to present our uh, speaker today, who's an internationally renowned pediatric cardiologist. We're very grateful and uh, lucky to have uh, Dr. Mark Friedberg speak with, speak with us today. Uh, in advance, I do want to acknowledge um, the sponsorship of Malincroft Pharmaceuticals. Uh, the Neonatal Human Dynamics and t &E NPE Foundations curriculum is supported by an unrestricted educational grant from Malincroft, and we're grateful for their uh, support. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Friedberg as our speaker today. He is a pediatric cardiologist at the Hospital for Sick Children and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto, as well as a senior associate scientist with the Sick Kids Research Institute. As a senior associate scientist, Dr. Friedberg has established an independent CIHR-funded basic science lab that uses animals and in vitro models to delineate the mechanisms of RV dysfunction and ventricular-ventricular interactions. He's been awarded major research funding from CIHR and the Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation, and is also the director of research in the ECHO Lab at Sick Kids. Dr. Friedberg's leadership in academic pediatric echocardiography has been acknowledged by various appointments, including the editorial boards of major uh, high-impact international journals, as well as in the American Society of Echocardiography. And his research contributions to the field were recognized as he was the 2018 Feigenbaum Lecturer at the American Society of Echo Annual Meeting, a very uh, prestigious uh, honor. Uh, Dr. Freeberg, it's a great, great pleasure to have you join us today and speak about uh, advanced uh, echocardiography techniques. And I'll, pass it, I'll uh, hand you the floor in one moment. And just a welcome to our panelists uh, who are the trainees in neonatal human dynamics. And a reminder uh, that uh, they're welcome to keep their video off during this recorded uh, part. Um, and But certainly if uh, Dr. Freeberg has some interactive questions, please do feel free to unmute yourself and participate. A warm welcome to our uh, attendees and the seminar uh, form. Uh, and I do welcome your feedback and input through the Q&A chat. And I'll be moderating a discussion at the conclusion of uh, Dr. Friedberg's talk. So with, without further ado, Dr. Friedberg, thank you very much for presenting with us today and I'll hand you the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weiss. Uh, very kind introduction, overly kind, I would say. Um, 
let me get this back up. All right, I just want to confirm that you're hearing and seeing uh, fine. Yeah, that looks great. And great, good. thank you. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, invitation. Um, and um, uh, I was asked to talk about advanced imaging techniques and a few subtopics which I've included uh, in the lecture. Um, and so what I'm gonna do, this is not advancing very well from there, so I have to do it from here. Um, I'm gonna talk what, uh, about what a function is and how we assess it talking about the LV, but also about the RV, focusing on, on methods and advanced methods that will uh, reflect global ventricular function and also regional function. I was asked to talk about tissue Doppler imaging as well as strain or deformation imaging. I've included some uh, 3D uh, topics and I was also asked to talk about uh, imaging of uh, blood flow. So uh, that's what I'm going to uh, focus on. So before we get into the advanced techniques, I thought it was worth spending a few minutes uh, about defining what cardiac function is, and also some basic, uh, um, basic things that I think are really important before going to advanced techniques. Uh, and here is one uh, definition of function, which is the ability of the heart to fill at a low enough pressure not to cause pulmonary congestion, that is diastolic function, but then to deliver a sufficient quantity of blood to the blood vessels at a high enough pressure to perfuse the tissue and then to be able to augment this performance during exercise. So as I said, this is diastolic function. You could then say that the middle portion of this is systolic function. And then this is what we call reserve. So when, when the metabolism increases, it could be exercise, it could be disease states or otherwise, you need to augment uh, that uh, performance. Now, um, you could look at function from uh, a variety of angles, if you will. We're, you can talk about cardiovascular function, which is purely that delivery of blood, meaning oxygen and other metabolites uh, to the tissue uh, at a rate uh, that meets uh, the demands, be it that oxygen consumption, for example, if we're supplying oxygen. Uh, so if you're an intensivist and you're in the NICU, that might be adequate to you without looking at anything else. You can talk about cardiac and ventricular function, which is really the pump activity that results in the adequate amount of cardiac output at low filling pressures. So if you're a cardiologist, you'd probably focus on that aspect of ventricular function. And then if you are someone interested in, in uh, ventricular function or myocardial function, such as myself, you would talk about the phasic shortening and force generation followed by lengthening and force decay. So systolic deformation and diastolic deformation. And really, um, I take the intensivist view, so I wish I was a neonatologist in a way, because really all that's the body's view. The body doesn't really care what the muscle is doing. All the body cares about is getting the sufficient oxygen and metabolites. And that's why these definitions of function are very, very uh, relevant. Uh, and so when we go into advanced techniques and we talk about strain and tissue Doppler, you have to remember that, that it's at this level uh, and not at that level. So there is no one definition of cardiac function and really uh, the question uh, you asking will give you the answer or the answer you're getting will depend on the question uh, you're answering. So please remember that when we uh, assess function. So uh, that's basically what I said. And the other thing uh, that uh, I wanna say here is that these are all surrogates of function uh, that really reflect uh, some aspects of the cardiac function. It doesn't uh, reflect all aspects of cardiac function. So this is a, a, a slide I borrowed from a, a colleague of mine, a friend, Bart Bainens, and it really nicely summarizes how we uh, look at a cardiac performance or function. Uh, and whatever uh, level uh, you look at it, be it at the um, level of the myocyte or the fibers, be it at the regional wall level, or be it at the global level, so these two constituting so-called ventricular function, two events occur. There's four, first a buildup of force, which could be pressure or wall stress or uh, myocyte force development that results in a change in the geometry. 
So if you're at the level of the cell or the myocyte, the myocyte shortens. Regionally, you're going to get increased deformation and then uh, uh, lengthening, so uh, in relaxation. And at the level of the pump, you're going to get ejection followed by filling. So a change in force or pressure or stress that brings out uh, brings about a change uh, in uh, geometry or in shape. And these uh, two events will be highly influenced by a number of uh, factors uh, that have quite complex interactions between them that are listed um, here. So this is summarized again uh, in the slide from one of uh, Bart's um, uh, articles and basically shows you that the deformation will lead to the pressure uh, development. And if you're talking about the left ventricle, the pressure in the ventricle will then overcome uh, the resistance uh, in the arteries leading to an opening of the outlet valve um, and ejection. And it's only here after all these events have occurred that you actually see ejection of blood and all the things that we look at by echocardiography all happen really at the end of the story, if you will, after all of this has uh, allowed this phase here, the ejection uh, to happen. And as I said, these will be highly influenced by the geometry of the ventricle or the fiber orientation, the elasticity of the tissue, the afterload, et cetera. So indeed, when we talk about performance, the three tenets that we all learned, uh, you know, in uh, college or in medical school or wherever, was that ventricular function is highly influenced by the afterload, meaning the resistance the ventricle has to overcome to eject blood, by the preload, which is really the degree of stretch of the myocyte right before uh, ejection, and we measure that by really rough surrogates. So that's the filling of the ventricle, the size of the ventricle at end diastole, uh, filling pressures, all kinds of surrogates for what really is the amount of myocyte stretch. And then this intrinsic uh, capacity of the muscle to contract or to generate force independent of these loading conditions, the so-called contractility. I don't want to go into a lot about this right now. This is a talk on function and echo rather than physiology, but contractility is a really elusive, um, uh, I would say, holy grail that everyone's chasing after because we really want to know what this muscle is able to do independent of how much weight is on this uh, uh, bar over here, but it's extremely difficult to get to that measure because that measure itself, uh, um, the way we measure it is dependent on, on the conditions. I think there are other really important things to consider but we, before we talk about advanced techniques and function, whether the changes that you visualize as acute versus chronic, uh, whether there has been adaptation of the heart, meaning if the heart has had time to adapt to these changes through various processes, such as hypertrophy, so adding contractile elements that will uh, increase the ability to build up force, for example. Heart rate is extremely important, as you know, especially if you're taking that first definition of function, which is output or cardiac output, uh, then the heart rate is uh, just one element of, of the product of heart rate and stroke volume to produce cardiac output and will influence a lot of the parameters of function itself that I talked about before. And then we have a variety of interactions between the various components in the system, be it between the ventricles or between the ventricle and the bed it's ejecting into, be it systemic uh, or pulmonary. So given all of that, you might say, okay, you're looking at an echo, and this is a talk about advanced techniques, but really, this is really enough. Everyone can see that this is a very dilated ventricle that functions poorly, and you don't need anything else to say that. And I would agree with you wholeheartedly that in this situation, that's probably enough. You, it's difficult to quantify anything, just eyeballing, uh, but certainly uh, you, we don't need fancy methods in many situations. And so we, what we do a lot of the time in the echo lab, and especially for the right ventricle, is we do eyeball. And there are many advantages to eyeballing. And again, I want to get on to the more advanced techniques, but those that uh, work with me, and I think there's some on the call, know that I, you don't, I don't think you can uh, 
interpret any of the data just with numbers or just with strain values or ejection fractions without actually looking at the echo, uh, despite the pitfalls of it being subjective with inter and intra observer reliabilities that are suboptimal. Uh, it is quick and easy. It does depend on experience. But on the other hand, I think you have to interpret echo in the context of what you see. Otherwise, it's very difficult just to take a strain number and know what it's showing. I also want to stress that the most basic techniques, before we move on to advanced techniques, the basic, most basic techniques are the most powerful predict, for predicting clinical event and what's going to happen with patients. This is an early study from the Texas group showing how just the end diastolic dimension of the left ventricle differentiated patients with dilated cardiomyopathy who were going to live or who were going to die. And we found very similar findings some years later when we uh, tracked these patients over time. And you can see that a very simple measurement without needing to go into strain, without needing tissue Doppler or any 3D or any fancy things that I'm going to show you is was the most powerful predictor amongst the variety of, um, of techniques that we used. And it very simply, if you increased your uh, ventricular dimensions by and large, so if if over time your ventricle dilated versus if over time your ventricle uh, shrunk or got smaller, that was going to be a very powerful predictor of how you did, whether you need a transplant or survived. And so from these dimensions, of course, which are powerful in and of themselves, you can get um, ejection fraction. And ejection fraction, which is simply the amount uh, of uh, blood as a proportion uh, that the ventricle uh, ejects uh, each cycle. So it's the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume. Uh, that is uh, in itself a very powerful predictor of outcomes. It has various pitfalls, as we know. Uh, but um, you can do this with a variety of methods by linear dimensions, by 2D areas, or by 3D echocardiography, uh, as I'll show you. But uh, these so-called conventional or older techniques, uh, I'm, I'm talking about them in a talk about advanced techniques because I don't think you should just use the advanced techniques. I think all of these other techniques are just adjunct to these basic um, um, things which reflect a lot of cardiac physiology. So this is just an example of a Simpsons biplane uh, ejection fraction, which gives you volumes uh, and then ejection fractions. And of course, uh, if we're talking about advanced techniques, uh, this is actually an old Philips slide, uh, but the software is basically the same. Um, and this is, a, I think, a GE uh, software that will give you um, uh, basically the same information uh, with 3D echocardiography. And 3D echocardiography has been found to be advantageous uh, to 2D and certainly to linear techniques because it overcomes a lot of the pitfalls of these te techniques when you have abnormal geometry. We know that all the techniques, uh, less so Simpsons, but certainly the M-mode linear uh, dimensions um, uh, and uh, the extrapolation to ejection fraction or fractional shortening rely on geometric assumptions and, and formulas. And those formulas don't work anytime you have an abnormal ventricle. And I think anytime we want to know ejection fraction, or many times we want to know ejection fraction, you have uh, abnormal geometry or abnormal ventricles. And that's certainly true in the neonates you take care of and in the patients we take care of uh, in cardiology. So even if you have PDA and the volume loading, uh, some of these assumptions don't hold true and uh, uh, 3D uh, uh, is advantageous. I'll also say in the same breath, however, that I think in neonatology, I wouldn't run to use 3D because with high heart rates, um, you may run into a problem with uh, you know volume rates or voxel rates or frame rates uh, because with high heart rates, 3D is still dependent on acquiring a number of images, even with, you know, the 1B techniques, I think there's still limitations. Um, and so um, you just got to be aware that you might be missing the peak systole or peak diastole and maybe under or overestimating or usually underestimating uh, volumes uh, that way. You still might get an accurate ejection fraction, but that might be spurious because you've underestimated 
the end systolic and end diastolic volumes to the same uh, degree. Um, so that's uh, just in a few words about uh, 3D. I'm not going to go in deeply into the actual methods and how to acquire. I think that's better done in a hands-on session or in a dedicated uh, lecture to 3D. But you'll notice you also get these regional volumes. Um, and I haven't done a lot of work with these regional volumes. Some have done some work. It's, uh, it's um, I think, relevant when you have uh, aneurysms uh, not so common in, in the neonate uh, uh, or in the infant population, uh, but sometimes it's useful. Some people have done some dyssynchrony work with that, but I think there are better methods for that. So by and large, we have not um, paid attention much to the regional volumes, but have concentrated on the global uh, ejection fraction, uh, if you will. Um, companies, uh, various companies such as TomTech now uh, taken over, uh, by uh, Philips and others, Siemens and GE today, also developed software for the right ventricle uh, and uh, right ventricular ejection fractions. I think that these methods um, uh, are really useful and uh, they are in uh, some of our clinical protocols, such as in Tetralogy of Fallot, uh, Palmy Hypertension and others, but we really aren't using them routinely yet. And that's because of issues with workflow. It's more difficult to acquire these images uh, the, the 3D of the RV has been around for many years, actually, decades, in fact, but still didn't catch up to the ease of use, I would say, uh, of the LV. And that's because of, like everything else in the RV, it's more complex, the complex geometry. And I think workflow in a busy practice still hinders acquiring right ventricle 3Ds today. But hopefully with time, um, this will improve and 3D of the RV will be incorporated um, into uh, practice. And even though there are quite a few studies showing underestimation compared to volumes acquired by cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, for example, it's still quite reliable, although less so in large hearts, which is less of a problem maybe for the neonates. So there hasn't been uh, enough validation done, I would say, in neonates. But when you look at repaired tetralogy of fellow uh, in older kids and in adults, there's quite a lot of validation work and there's quite a bit of scatter also. Um, at the, uh, at the extremes, uh, the larger ventricles where you really need these techniques. So in the, um, we, we wrote some consensus or, or a consensus statement where we said that techniques developed for the LV shouldn't automatically be used uh, for the RV and RV software can be used, but still uh, uh, there's more work to be done there. Now, one of the things that might um, uh, advance the incorporation into clinical practice, and again, this has been around for a few years, but is not yet routine in all labs, is you acquire a full block of 3D data. You know, you take your transducer, you acquire the full block, and then the software automatically segments uh, uh, specific chambers, or in fact, today, all four chambers can be segmented automatically by the software. And so you get a whole heart or each chamber volume uh, and ejection fraction. This is certainly not routine yet, but if we're looking at advanced techniques and with the very rapid development of echo technology, of segmentation, of machine learning and AI to improve quality of segmented um, analysis and uh, to extrapolate for example, missing segments uh, and build a model, um, this may indeed become a routine and uh, is already, I mean, as I said, this technology is around for a few years, but like every technology, um, there's been rapid advances and it continues to advance, but I think this will become uh, routine on machines in the years to come and all companies, I think, are, are all vendors, I would say, are really uh, interested in putting them on their platforms. Um, now, as I said to you, so those are ejection fractions by various techniques, but ejection fractions, as I said, has limitations, both in terms of the technical limitations and also physiologic limitations, which I'm not going to go into because that's not the focus uh, of the lecture. But we all know that all of these ejection indices and volumes are highly dependent on preload, they're dependent on afterload, and they're dependent on heart rate. And the problem with that isn't a problem per se, because I think you should be evaluating the function 
at the current loading conditions. The problem is if loading changes and ejection fraction change, can you truly know what the underlying function is or can you attribute that to a change in uh, the performance because of loading or because of the intrinsic contractility? So that's what needs to go through your mind. But because of those um, um, limitations, I would say, and because we're only looking at the ejection uh, phase, as I showed you in those first slides, for many years there's been uh, um, an interest in using timing and other techniques to uh, get at function. And in fact, systolic time intervals were one of the first techniques um, popularized in the 1970s to kind of assess function. And the reason I'm including them here in an advanced talk is because Dr. Weiss asked me to talk about myocardial performance index, but I want you to really know where this comes from. So the systolic time intervals uh, in the 1970s really measured the pre-ejection time. So here is a Doppler in the outflow tract uh, measuring uh, aortic ejection, and this is ejection time. So so from here to here, and the time from onset of the QRS to the time of ejection is the pre-ejection time. Now, obviously, it's going to be dependent on heart rate, but you can know from the, the first slides that I was talking to you about that the pre-ejection time or the isovolemic contraction time, and again, I didn't go a lot into physiology, that's a separate talk, is crucial in allowing the ventricle to build up enough force to overcome the resistance it needs to eject into. So this information of how long it takes for the ventricle to build up that force became a really useful number. And although it's fallen a bit out of vogue, I would say, I think it's a, it's a really um, relevant uh, and very simple to measure uh, index. A lot of people have corrected it for the ejection time to kind of relate the two. And just like this is the isovolemic contraction time or the pre-ejection time, which actually includes the electromechanical delay. At the other end of the cardiac cycle in diastole, which I'll come to, there's the isovolemic relaxation time, which is the time um, uh, from uh, really the closure of the aortic valve uh, to the opening of the mitral valve. So that time when there is no filling of uh, the ventricle, even though the heart has started to uh, relax. So the myocardial performance index really said, okay, you've got these two time intervals, the isovolemic contraction and the isovolemic relaxation over here, which are periods which in, in, this, in this index, if you will, uh, you, know, you could think of as work being done that is not being used for ejection. It's critical work because it allows ejection, as I said, but it's work or it's, it's prep work, if you will, that, that, that goes into allowing ejection. So you could say, okay, well, that's kind of wasted time, if you will, or if it's non-effective time, or it's practicing the lecture before I give it. It's not the actual time. It's not the effective time of the lecture. So let's make an index and um, um, that reflects these kind of time intervals combined together and indexed to the ejection time. And this was popularized or it was uh, published initially uh, by Tay from Japan and became a really popular index. And uh, what he did was measured this time here between the end of um, mitral filling. First, it was published for the left ventricle and then subsequently for the right ventricle until the onset of the next cycle of filling. And then you take the ejection time uh, and you then minus this overall interval by the ejection time. And when you do this as a ratio over the ejection time, you get the so-called performance index. Now on the left ventricle, this is easy to get because you can increase your sample Doppler sample volume and straddle the inflow and outflow and get these two um, signals of the mitral inflow and the aortic outflow or the left ventricular outflow simultaneously and measure the Tay index in that way. Um, but in the right ventricle, you can't capture these two uh, inflows and outflow signals simultaneously, and uh, you have to uh, take it in two separate cardiac cycles, uh, which then uh, really, uh, I think, impacts the accuracy of the measurement. The heart rate has to be the same. The ejection time may not be quite the same, etc. Uh, 
And so it's easier to do for the left ventricle than the right ventricle, even though it has been published for the right ventricle, the normal values. And in fetal medicine, it's very popular and the obstetricians just love this index uh, for almost every condition. And one of the reasons that it is a powerful index is it's like ejection fraction. It does correlate with clinical outcomes because it takes a so-called global measure, a word I absolutely hate because you can't delineate what's going on and where the problem is, but the global being it takes systolic and diastolic performance, if you will, the isovolemic contraction and relaxation, and then takes them together and corrects it for the ejection. So there's a lot of relevance to that, but it also, um, it obscures what is happening in the heart. So why not know what's happening with the isovolemic contraction time separately, with the isovolemic relaxation time separately, and then know what's going on and see where your dysfunction is? Why do you have to make a global index that, what, what, that it might be powerful on the one hand and correlate with clinical performance, but on the other hand, doesn't allow you to delineate these um, various um, parameters? In fetal medicine, I can kind of understand in a way why you would do that, because when you measure very short uh, um, um, periods like isovolemic relaxation period, um, when heart rates are very high, obviously you're going to get inaccuracies in your measurement. It's more difficult to measure a small interval at high heart rates than a longer interval in an adult or in an adolescent, for example. So that's one reason that it might be advantageous. Now, the word or the name of the so-called myocardial performance index also suggests that it's assessing myocardial function. And I actually, in the interest of time, took out a few slides to explain why it may not be doing that. I think it's a, it is a global index in the way that it's summing up a lot of things happening in the ventricle, one of which is myocardial performance. But it is not a measure of contractility. It has everything in life has contractility embedded in it, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be alive. And so does the myocardial performance index, but it per se changes with loading. Um, and there's been some nice work out of uh, Toronto uh, in, in, in the years before I came here, actually, um, from Michael Chung and Andrew Reddington showing that. Um, but don't take this as a measure of contractility per se. It's a measure of contractility, just like ejection fraction is a measure of contractility, although it reflects different things. So uh, enough said perhaps about the myocardial performance index. Use it if you choose. Um, but I want to get on to other indices, which are indices of so-called myocardial function. And the first one uh, that Dr. Weiss asked me to talk about, um, uh, and uh, especially diastolic parameters of this, is tissue Doppler um, imaging, uh, which is, remember, a regional measurement. We use it to kind of talk about global, meaning ventricular overall function. But when you place a sample at one place in the myocardium, by definition, you are measuring regional function at that segment. And you have to ask yourself whether function at that segment reflects function in the ventricle as a whole. There is one reason among many, which I haven't gone into, why I think you have to actually look at an echo and understand what's going on instead of just taking a blind number. If I told you that the S prime is 10, well, does that mean anything? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but you have to look at this whole heart to understand what that number means. So when we place a sample um, in the myocardium, we get a few waves. We get a systolic wave, we get an early diastolic and a late diastolic waves. And you'll see that those really reflect the blood Doppler. Here is the systolic wave, which reflects ejection. It happens between the, eye, between the aortic valve opening and closure, and we've marked these intervals to show you here. Here is then uh, the aortic valve closure, and you see here early filling in diastole, and then late filling, and then aortic valve opening again later on. And the way these signals are generated is really a Doppler technique, just like you know from blood flow Doppler, with filtering after the acquisition, to A, get rid of the blood noise. So um, those are just filters, uh, imaging filters. And then uh, the filters also um, eliminate 
the high velocity signals of the blood and just uh, allow the very low velocity of the tissue um, to come through. So just for example, if in the aorta, we look at velocities at around 100 centimeters per second, you can see here that we're imaging at around six in this example. And if I, I'll show you pulse Doppler next, it's around 10 or 12 or 15, up to 20, let's say on the tricuspid side, but not more than that. So the tissue, the myocardium moves at a much slower rate than the blood uh, it's moving, if you will, or it causes the motion thereof. So it's really interesting. And that's true of deformation as well. When I get to strain, you'll see that the tissue deforms by a very small amount. So let's say 15, 20% to allow an ejection of around 50, 60 or 70%. So that is color tissue Doppler imaging, and color tissue Doppler is an average of the velocities at that point, and that means that as an average velocity, it's going to be a lower uh, uh, value than pulse tissue Doppler, which is uh, the next technique I'm going to show you after just showing you this example. Oh. Sorry, it's crashed looking. It's not on this computer, so it won't play. But this is just the, showing the same thing in, in, a, in a child with dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, showing the same signals. And the advantage of color tissue Doppler is that you could sample the whole ventricle simultaneously at good frame rates, high frame rates compared to other techniques. And you could put your sample wherever you want and get a velocity um, over there. And we've used it in congenital heart disease and in the right ventricle as well. And I'm highlighting that again, these are, are advanced techniques, but certainly not new techniques. You know, this paper was now published 20 years ago um, out of the Leuven group. Uh, and you can see looking at, at uh, velocities and deriving strain and strain rate, which I'll come to from the tissue Doppler uh, signal. So this has really been around now for quite a while and still is not routine in all pediatric echo labs, uh, but has become, uh, uh, tissue Doppler imaging at least, has become standard in most labs, I would say. What has become more popular or more in use because, again, of uh, va better validation, uh, more uh, less vendor dependency, and more similar to blood uh, Doppler is pulse tissue Doppler. So just like you can pulse the blood, you can pulse the tissue, and with those same um, those same filtering techniques, you can get rid of the blood flow uh, signals, so the high velocity, uh, high intensity signals, and you can, sorry, the high velocity, low intensity signals, and you left here with the systolic early and late diastolic uh, signals. And you'll also notice that during this isovolemic period, so here is the QRS signal before the aortic valve has opened, you get this additional signal, the isovolemic acceleration, uh, which I'll speak about uh, in a moment. And here, just to show you an example of pulse tissue Doppler in this adolescent with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can see that you can sample at the various regions and get relatively good, although not normal, tricuspid uh, velocities and uh, probably reduced velocities at the septum and reduced velocities and abnormal tissue Doppler at the mitral valve. And, this, uh, and these velocities are abnormal both in their actual velocity. So let's say this adolescent here at the S wave is six or seven, but you can see the signals are fragmented. They're very abnormal. Diastolic velocities are very low in this uh, adolescent. Look at, at this hypertrophic septum. You can see here an E wave of two or three, whereas in this age, it should be more as somewhere between uh, 12 and 15, I would say, or even more uh, in, this, um, uh, in this adolescent. So these are useful to quantify uh, both systolic and diastolic function, whereas we struggled if, uh, in many parameters to quantify diastolic function, and we still continue to struggle. This hasn't solved our problems by any means. Now, um, Danny asked me to talk about the E to E prime ratio, so I'll just show you here, and I'll come to that more in detail in a few minutes, but I'll show you that here the E wave uh, is um, is blunted in this adolescent, uh, but here's the mitral inflow E wave, and here's the tissue Doppler E wave, and the ratio is going to be of these two signals, and I'll come back to that um, in a few moments. And so this measure um, 
I just want to switch the order here, uh, of isovolemic acceleration, which I showed you that early signal during the QRS complex, during the isovolemic contraction period. Uh, so that's the IVCT, if you will, when we talked about the pre-ejection period, is this signal was popularized by Michael Vogel and Andrew Reddington as the slope of this, um, of this signal uh, happens before the aortic valve, has opened, it happens after the mitral valve has closed, and so should be relatively independent of loading conditions, and they validated this work, which was the, the previous uh, slide here, as a measure of cardiac contractility. Well, there's a lot of controversy uh, about whether that's true or not, and what exactly uh, it reflects. Uh, what I can tell you is it hasn't caught on in clinical practice. It can be used in some situations, such as this paper from uh, our lab, showing um, uh, how it can reflect heart rate reserve in uh, exercise, for example. So if you plot it against heart rate, uh, you can see um, that control patients have an increasing force frequency relationship, meaning you increase contractility with the increasing heart rate of exercise, whereas coarctation of the aorta patients struggle to do that over here, and so you have a different curve. But what is really prohibited, even if you accept that it does um, reflect contractility, and as I said, there's, there is a lot of uh, controversy around that, um, this is, out of all echo parameters that uh, reflect function, this is the one that in the pediatric heart network uh, uh, volume variability uh, study, uh, which, um, which, which really went into great detail of a high number of indices, had the poorest measurement error. And you can see why, if you have a patient with uh, abnormal function, you had a bad angle. And even here, you can see that to measure a slope here is extremely difficult. And you can you, you, you get very high errors up to almost 50% here. So as an index, that wasn't acceptable for um, uh, clinical use. So some people still use it in research. Um, it's thought to be an advanced method, but there are certainly pitfalls um, associated with that. Now, um, because uh, Danny asked me to talk about the E to E prime ratio and about um, color M mode or of, uh, the velocity of uh, color flow propagation in the left ventricle, uh, I just want to give a very short, uh, brief introduction about filling in the left ventricle. And again, this is not a diastolic talk. Um, that's a whole talk in and of itself, but really diastole happens when the pressures in the left ventricle fall below those in the left atrium as the uh, ventricle rapidly uh, relaxes over here. And you get this period of short period of filling, a very rapid filling, which happens here early in diastole. And we have various measures, as I said, from that, the time it takes for the mitral valve to open after the aortic valve is closed, the velocity of the E wave, which is this early diastolic filling and the deceleration time. And we use this in echo all the time to try and assess diastolic uh, filling. Um, but what happens in a ventricle that can't uh, relax properly and can't suck blood into the ventricle during early diastole is that it becomes more and more dependent on high pressures that build up in the atrium to force blood, if you will, into the ventricle. So the filling of the ventricle is a function of either how well the ventricle can pull blood into the ventricle versus how much it has to depend on the atrium or just the filling pressures pushing blood uh, into the ventricle. And so what happens in these are the classic adult um, uh, diagrams of diastolic function. What happens as you progress, and this is adult disease, this doesn't hold true for um, pediatrics as we showed uh, a few years ago, but it does allow me to explain what we're looking at in the E to E prime ratio and in the color M mode down here, is that as you progress, you'll notice that because relaxation becomes abnormal, and then as filling pressures go up, your E wave initially drops, but then as the blood is forced into the ventricle, it again increases, and that's called so-called pseudo-normalization because it's very difficult to distinguish this pattern from that pattern. And that's where 
tissue Doppler, and that's why I put it here in the talk after tissue Doppler, became useful, at least in these papers, which came out of the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic, uh, to show you how the tissue Doppler E prime stays very abnormal, very low. And so then you can use the E over E prime ratio to kind of reflect the filling pressures, because if the filling pressures are what's driving the E here and the E prime stays low, then the E over E prime should reflect those filling pressures. And indeed, Sharif Nagar from um, uh, Houston, Texas, um, published this uh, highly cited paper, landmark paper, if you will, that correlated the filling pressures, in this case, the wedge pressures with the E over E prime ratio. And you can see that the normals down here uh, are, are really have low E to e, uh, e to E prime ratio. And this is by pulse tissue Doppler and uh, the abnormals go along this linear relationship over here so that you could predict the filling pressures. And he drew these zones. If you were less than this and above that, you were clearly normal or abnormal. And then there was this gray area. However, this became really a problematic index in my eyes. And I think this slide, this very validation slide shows you why. A, you have a lot of scatter, even if you choose the normal group and the abnormal group. So if you have, let's say, an E to E prime ratio over here, you might have a filling pressure of 15 or you might have one of 35. Those are very different. And again, I told you that we have to interpret all of these indices depending on whether they're acute or chronic, et cetera. Um, and so a filling pressure of 35 can be lethal. If it's acute, it can be tolerated. If it's very chronic, but you don't know where you are. The other problem is that really the E prime does go up. It doesn't stay completely the same. And that was even in those kind of fuzzy diagrams from the old Cleveland Clinic schemas. Um, it does go up with increased filling pressure. So if both go up, it's not going to reflect very well the, the filling, the E over E prime isn't going to uh, reflect very well the filling pressures. On the other hand, if you have delayed relaxation, you get uh, much less change in the E prime with an increase in the filling pressures so of the transmitral pressure gradient. And so the E over E prime will go up. Now in pediatrics, I can tell you, and certainly I think this will hold true. This is an assumption. I don't know it for sure, but you, there is much less isolated dela delayed relaxation uh, than the adults see in, in their heart disease, in ischemic heart disease and other. And so I think that this E to E over prime uh, isn't going to hold well for filling pressures in pediatrics. And um, indeed, the first uh, paper that came out from Will Border 20 years ago now, uh, you see here a huge number of scatter. This was a very mixed population. It was a small population, but was uh, it was, uh, if you will, um, um, the uh, first paper. Uh, this paper was only the E prime, in fact, it wasn't the E over E prime, and they correlated with tau, but there was still a lot of scatter. So if you see a lot of scatter over there with tau and the E over E prime, you're going to get a lot of, and you don't have isolated delayed relaxation, you're going to have a lot of scatter in the E over E prime. Nonetheless, both the E prime and the E over E prime have ha have correlated well with clinical outcomes, because again, I think they summarize a lot of what is happening in the ventricle. And I think the E prime, particularly over time in many research studies, has adequately differentiated, at least on a research level, uh, between abnormals and normals and correlated with outcomes. And this was, an, again, an early paper uh, where Ben Idem was interested in, in tissue Doppler and showed that it correlates with outcomes in this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And others have shown it in many other conditions as well. And here's just an example of a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with so-called restrictive physiology, meaning there are increased filling pressures. You can see how the E is kind of tented and elevated. I won't talk about this way. Wave now, there's hardly any A wave, and you've got a low tissue Doppler. So in this case, the E over E prime is going to show you the increased filling pressures. But you have to look at the echo because you'll also see a dilated in these reference images, a dilated left atrium, which is also going to give you a clue to that. And you can also see that the filling happens very early on here with very little late filling in this image. And this image is a color M mode, which will lead us to the next topic in a few slides time. So this uh, 
all we do over here is we allow Doppler flow of blood to come through the mitral valve, and then you put an M mode scan line through that Doppler flow. And so you're going to get an M mode of the color Doppler along the scale or along the, the X axis, if you will, which is time. Here are the cardiac cycles depicted by the ECG. And so red, as in any Doppler, is blood coming towards you and blue is blood going away from you. So you can see here that there's predominantly filling over here in early diastole, hardly any filling in late diastole, and here is the outflow. And this blue over here is a signal being caught by the M mode, probably um, either motion in the aorta or somewhere else along this M mode line uh, in early systole. But this is the signal that I want you to concentrate on. So indeed, that can maybe tell us a little bit about early filling. And um, I've been talking about systolic function and diastolic function, but really the two are connected because that sucking of blood or the pushing of blood, if you will, by in an abnormal ventricle in early diastole is highly dependent on what happens in the previous cardiac cycle. And it happens through this motion called torsion, as well as just the elastic energy stored in the myocardium. So when the myocardium contracts, there's a buildup of potential energy through the elasticity of the tissue that is released in early diastole. And there's a torsion, a ringing motion of the heart that's released and in untwisting an early diastole, and that sucks blood into the ventricle uh, in early diastole and helps us in, in example in exercise when you don't have a lot of time uh, to relax. So that color M mode could help us delineate these, the sucking of blood, if you will, in the ventricle in early diastole. And this is uh, it was, it was um, formulated in these color M mode uh, work that Jim Thomas from the Cleveland Clinic at the time um, um, validated with the slope of this aliasing velocity. So if you put on a color M mode and you turn down your, your color uh, scale so that it's aliasing over here, you get here um, a slope uh, of, of uh, the velocity that from this, uh, through the Euler equation, I'm not going to go into that, but it's just a derivative of the Bernoulli equation, uh, you can then derive the velocities. I'm going to skip over, uh, you can then derive, sorry, the intraventricular pressure gradients. I'm going to skip over the next few slides on this coupling uh, to get to um, strain imaging. And strain came about because of many pitfalls of tissue Doppler, and because the technology of Evolved to be able uh, to derive how well the muscle is contracting. I'm going to skip over completely strain derived from tissue Doppler imaging, but that's historically was the first technique where strain imaging came about, at least in echocardiography, and that was the first strain. And then uh, tissue speckle tracking came about afterwards and is now the dominant technique that you know many of you use uh, um, in your research or even in your practice. And this is part of our clinical protocols. And what this software does here, it just tracks the little speckles that you see in any echo image, uh, and it looks for patterns of that of the motion of those speckles, and then can tell you uh, how the uh, speckles have moved over time and it knows the time so it can derive how fast that has occurred and then you can get the shortening of the tissue the relaxation of the tissue and strain rate is how fast that uh, shortening and relaxation has occurred i'm not going to talk about strain rate further um, we don't use it in practice because of the in intrinsic and inherent noise in the signal but strain imaging in cardiology today certainly in adult cardiology has become an accepted technique. Um, and you can measure strain in various uh, uh, vectors. You can measure it uh, in the longitudinal direction as the myocardium shortens and lengthens. You can measure it in the circumferential um, direction as it shortens and lengthens in, in the circular dimension or in the short axis. And then you can measure it in the thickening aspect, which is really a result of the shortening in those other two uh, dimensions. And so from that, you get longitudinal, circumferential, and the resulting radial strain. So this is shortening, and this is thickening and thin. And so here's just an example in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And again, 
to me, strain is particularly useful for looking at these regional differences. And I brought this example because you can see these two curves over here are the basal septum, which don't deform at all uh, in this patient. So even though we say ejection fraction will be normal and this so-called normal function, which is far from the truth, you can see that global strain is impacted by these segments not contracting. And so the global or the average strain really is just the average of a, a 16 or 17 segment model of the bull's eye. So these various segments and in clinical practice, longitudinal strain has become uh, really the, 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 the method of choice at the moment. Uh, all three uh, directions are moved, uh, are used in research. And we, in practice, use the average strain, and it's been shown clinically, at least in adult cardiology, and there are papers in pediatrics as well, that it may be more sensitive in predicting uh, um, clinical endpoints versus uh, ejection fraction. We've used it in the right ventricle to track uh, right ventricular function over time. Uh, we use it in dysynchrony assessment, in palmary hypertension, and I'm going to skip over more of these research um, um, uh, uh, techniques, I would say, or research domains. And I do want to mention in terms of advanced techniques, um, 3D strain. Again, um, there's more uh, literature or the, or the technology now is advancing where frame rates are better. And there are different types of strain or different parameters, I would say, of strain that are coming out of 3D, uh, such as area strain, which is really an average over the 3D area, or maximal strain in any one of those directions, so principal strain. These are still in the domain of research, but I think in the years to come may be incorporated into practice. But because this is a lecture on advanced techniques, I wanted just to mention them. Now, one of the other things that I was asked to talk about was blood flow. And the reasons why we might look at different components of blood flow is because it can tell us something about systolic function, diastolic function, atrial function, look at turbulence of flow uh, in disease, um, uh, and look at flow in the blood vessels. Now, I'm going to go really fast over what is a complex topic, and I don't mind if you don't, if, you know, if this is too fast um, to really absorb. I just wanted to bring it up. Uh, it's going to use the same principles that we talked about previously, and most of this is still in the research application. This is not part of regular clinical practice yet. Uh, the two main um, uh, techniques that are used is what's called vector flow mapping, which is really uh, an ingenious idea of taking the velocities or the blood velocities that you know from regular Doppler, which are in the direction of the Doppler signal, but then using the wall tracking, which is the same as you do for strain, um, to track the radial velocities. And then what the equations do is it, it calculates starting from the wall, from tracking the myocardium, to look at the radial velocities, combine that with the flow velocities that you know just from regular Doppler, and then come to those flow lines that you see, uh, which you saw in this um, image over here, so that you can really get blood flow throughout uh, the ventricle. And there's quite a bit of validation work um, uh, through engineering techniques of that. The second method is actually using very high frame rate imaging, which I'm not going to go into the technicalities at all of. But instead of imaging at whatever it is, 40 frames per second, 100 frames per second, 200 frames per second, you're now imaging at thousands of frames per second. And that allows you to track the high velocity blood particles, the same speckles that you were tracking in the wall, you can now track in the blood flow and visualize instead of just the regular Doppler uh, flow, you can visualize uh, the color flow and you can tell where data are missing and fill that in. I'm going to skip over that. And today, because of the very high frame rates, this comes from the Norwegian group. Um, you can then do this in 3D as well. And again, this is at high frame rates. So we're not missing out on frame rates over here. There are many other problems, of course, but you can get this in three dimensions. So here is an example 
example, just of the regular color flow in a neonate with a VSD. And here you can see these very intricate flow patterns of uh, the neonate um, uh, with uh, uh, this uh, blood speckle tracking. Now, these are, and, and again, you can use this uh, in, in quantifying systolic and diastolic function. And these are not just pretty pictures, but we derive, or you can derive um, quantitative information uh, out of this, and it mainly talks to the efficiency of the ventricle. So how much energy are you losing? How much vorticity and abnormal vorticity, because you have normal vortices in the ventricles, but there are also abnormal vortices formed when you have dysfunction. And so you really can quantify the energy loss in the ventricles or in the blood vessels um, for that uh, matter. And these are just now again in the domain of research. So figuring out what are normal values, where in what conditions, is there energy loss and how does this impact clinical course and how do interventions or medications or let's say a PDA closure, how does that impact the energy loss in the ventricle? And so here's just an example of a, a normal flow in a ventricle as opposed to a dilated cardiomyopathy. And you can see without going into details that the flow is completely uh, uh, different uh, over there. And, and I talked about this following the color M mode because one of the applications that is being looked at is how can you derive the intraventricular pressure gradients and how can you talk about that the ventricle sucking blood into uh, the ventricle in early diastole versus late diastole and how is the energy efficiency of uh, doing that. And we can do this now in the right ventricle as well. In fact, uh, you can do it in many types of circulations. We um, uh, People, I'm not doing this research myself, but people including our group are really uh, interested in how this uh, functions in the single ventricle, those with the Fontan circulation, where we know ventricle Ventricular mechanics are quite abnormal um, and there can be ventricular problems. You can do this because of the high frame rates. You can do this um, in the fetus. And then in my last slide uh, before finishing, and I'm actually not going to summarize be um, uh, because these are such diverse uh, techniques, but I just wanted to mention this is not relevant for neonatal echo, except if you do this pharmacologically, then it would be relevant. But Using exercise, we really look at reserve, and you can use any of these techniques really, but tissue Doppler and strain being particularly useful, I would say, to look at function during exercise, and we've done some interesting research. Of course, the adults use this clinically to look at wall motion abnormalities, but we use it to look at function, and so do the adults. And I guess if you're using dobutamine, you could use this as well in neonates to look at differences in the contractile uh, reserve. So I just wanted to mention that in one slide, and I think I'm going to uh, end over there. So thank you for your attention. And I think we have left some time for questions as well. Danny asked me to finish at three. I finished at 3.03, so, which is good for me, Danny. So um, I'll take any questions. And shall I stop sharing the screen at this time? Actually, if, Mark, if you don't mind, uh, hang on to the screen just in case there are okay. questions specifically about any of the slides. First off, thank you so yeah. much. That was an absolutely fantastic overview that people, this is an overview of people's careers, I think, uh, you know, over the last uh, 20 years. So thank you for somehow packaging it into a, a very uh, manageable for us in terms of the, the volume and, uh, and depth of information.